Hi there, everyone. I know it is a little bit early yet, but I figured I would jump on uh, a little bit in advance to make sure I didn't have any technical issues. So this is uh, Bob Martin with uh, Nautilus Dry Docks RC Sub.com. I'm going to be live here for the next hour or so, or as long as my cell phone battery holds out and uh, answering your questions live. Uh, if you have any questions about the hobby of RC submarines, uh, I will be happy to do my best to answer them. Uh, like I said in the description earlier, I do not profess to be the world's foremost expert on RC submarines, but I've been doing it for a while. And uh, if I know the answer, I'll be happy to pass it along. If not, maybe I know the person who does know or I can find out for the next session, which I hope to do uh, on a monthly basis. So uh, absolutely, if you have any questions, uh, type them up in the chat window, uh, which I'm hoping works because this is the first time that I've ever done a live video. And I have to say I am not um, overly familiar with the process. So. We're gonna give this a shot, uh, first time for you, maybe first time for me, and uh, let's see what we can do. So maybe until I see some messages coming through, I'll just walk you around my shop here a little bit, and you can take a look and see what I've got going on. Um, if you follow my channel, you've uh, seen this big German Type 21 uh, RC submarine. This came out of Germany. It's a one-off uh, hull. It's made out of a really, really thick fiberglass, like a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, resin appendages, some beautiful brass props. I fabricated all of the um, dive planes and everything, and this is a, a separate laser cut deck that uh, I put on to the top of it, uh, fiberglass conning tower, and these are uh, 3D printed uh, gun turrets. Uh, 3D printing is something that I utilize on a regular basis. Uh, it's a great tool, uh, you know, new technology makes things a lot more accurate, a lot faster. Uh, I really like it, even though there are some purists out there who say it's really not the same thing as model building, but uh, we can argue that point later. Uh, I got some aluminum functional torpedo tube doors because of course this is going to have functional torpedoes when we are all done. I can show you what the start of that looks like right here. Um, these are all the prototype parts, uh, the rear assembly and the seals, main drive motor, uh, again 3D printed uh, pro scale propellers. It's so a lithium polymer battery, a timer module, and a read switch. And basically the way that this is rigged up, you can either select a three second or a five second runtime. Uh, as soon as a magnet is disengaged uh, from the read switch, the motor fires up for a, a five second period. Got some other things I got going on uh, over here. I just unpacked these this morning. Um, these are some really big um, RC submarine hulls. Um, we've got a, a skipjack hull in there. We've got a German, I believe this is a Type 214. That's a brand new uh, kit and a, and a really big Los Angeles class submarine. Um, one thing that I've talked about before that they, both of these uh, unfortunately are, are victims of is uh, the builder, and you can actually see a little bit of it right here, used wood. Don't, don't do that. Uh, wood and, and water really are not designed to mix unless you get, um, you know, the really expensive woods or take an exorbitant amount of time to prep the wood, uh, you know, seal it with resin and that kind of thing. But if you do not perfectly seal it, the water will get into it uh, and the wood will swell and it'll crack and uh, unfortunately it will make a mess of things. So I know it's tempting. Wood is easy to work with, um, but unfortunately it does not stand up well to water. So it will be um, a bad for you. In the long run, just trust me. We had a couple of questions in there. Uh, are some statements from, from Daniel Knight 
3D print the model parts and assemble them together. Well, I think the, the argument is that assembling parts isn't really the same thing as building a model. There's a thread uh, on my forums, the, the Subdriver forums. You guys should really check it out if you're looking for a lot of background information there. Um, it's the difference between taking parts and assembling them, so being a kit as uh, assembler, uh, and being a model builder, which in, in point of discussion was fabricating everything from scratch. So I actually don't do uh, anymore a lot of scratch building. I do a lot of kit assemblies because people contract with me to build their boats, uh, you know, things that they like. Um, but uh, my very first model, the Nautilus from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, was a scratch built model. It took me three years. Uh, because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I managed to hook up with a lot of uh, very knowledgeable people that talked me through the entire process. And that involved building uh, a wooden master because I didn't know any better, like I was talking about earlier, um, with wood and water didn't mix. And so I ended up having to create the entire master out of wood uh, and then laying up rubber molds and then fiberglass castings. So that was uh, my experience there. Janice, yes, that is your kit. It's beautiful. Let's take a closer look at it here. So, you know, from what I can tell um, in here, the lower hull is, um, you know, fiberglass, fiber, fiberglass uh, mat. And then the upper hull is uh, epoxy layup. And that makes it really, really light, uh, which is great. So for RC submarines, uh, anything above the water line, you want to be as light as possible so that you can reduce the size that you need for your ballast tank. So you can just see a lot of really great uh, details here. There's a lot of kits that we offer for Janus um, on my website, Nautilus Dry Docks, uh, including that, uh, that 214 kit. Let's talk about some, you know, standard FAQs, and, and these are on my website as well. Um, people, uh, you know, there's some, some general things that um, people always ask. So how fast do they go? It depends on the style of the boat. If you're talking about like a World War II era fleet boat, you're, you're going to have to be fighting a lot of hydrodynamic uh, drag. Um, so they're going to typically go much slower than like a modern nuclear boat uh, typically would. Obviously, the, the more modern designs are um, much more efficient through the water. So um, I find on average, you know, using standard mod, um, you know, modeling motors and that kind of thing, you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, a fast walking pace uh, is about what you're going to get. And now, of course, there's um, differences to that. You're going to have some boats that you're going to want to have a very stately scale speed uh, that may be slower than that. And then you have some uh, that are designed more for uh, aquabatics and, and speed. Uh, and you can get up to a running pace with some of those. Um, I'm just looking. So the upper hull is not epoxy anymore, but fiberglass. That's good to know. So this must be an, an older kit. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, how deep do they go? So that really depends on how well you engineered your watertight cylinder or your dry compartment. Um, with a standard cylinder, some of the older style D&E watertight cylinders, like what I've got right here, um, I've gone down to 30 feet without a leak. Uh, and that was accidentally, don't typically operate uh, at that depth. Uh, I misjudged my um, gas use and uh, ended up sinking that boat all the way to the bottom of the um, water and it stayed there for about five or ten minutes at the 30 feet. Um, this would be a good segue into the, the couple different types of watertight cylinders or watertight compartments. So this is a, a cylinder and um, North American builders kind of favor this. The idea behind them is that you can swap out the module between models. Um, in practical application, what I actually find is not very many builders actually swap the cylinder between multiple models. And the reason is, is that um, you set up your model for use with a specific size of ballast tank. Um, and that varies from model to model. So unless you have uh, models that are very, very similar, and what's the fun in that, um, you're going to need to have a different size ballast tank. Now, some of the older d &E cylinders had a crank 
on the back and you could vary the size of the ballast tank. So that was a bit of a workaround. But realistically, um, this is a pay to play hobby. It is not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so people will just get a new cylinder and they'll have a, a custom cylinder for each boat. So that's more of a you know a North American um, style of thing. So the, the Europeans tend to like their dry hull boats. Um, now this boat was originally engineered to be uh, a dry hull. So it's actually got a, a plate, for lack of a better term, that runs the entire length of the boat. And the idea is that you put clear plastic uh, panels on the top that can press down like an O-ring. And the problem with that is you have about a bajillion bolts uh, or nuts that you need to undo every time you need to get into the boat. It is a major pain in the butt. Um, the Engel boats um, were very popular for that style. They've since gone to more of a, of a cylinder style in their um, boats like the Lafayette uh, in the new uh, German Type 7 kit that they have. So that's more of a, of a cylinder style. It's much easier to get in and out of. Um, certainly the last thing you want to do is take 15 minutes bolting everything down, um, test it or forget to have put a switch on or to make a connection and have to take everything apart again. And obviously with all that surface area of the seals, the odds of something uh, having a nick or, or a, a leak in it are much higher as well. So um, the other disadvantage to the dry hull boats is that you need to offset all of the buoyancy of that huge dry area. So I want you just to think about this for a minute. This boat here is, you know, over eight feet long. Um, think about uh, a tube eight feet long and, and about 10 inches in diameter and try and push that underneath the water in a swimming pool. Try and imagine what that, that would feel like. So you need hundreds of pounds of ballast to get that underneath the water. Um, that is not fun to move. It's not fun to pick up out of the water. Um, something like this would require two or three people um, or a specialized custom crane or something like that in order to um, get it up out of the water. So with a, with a wet hull boat, which is where the cylinders come in, the water drains out of the boat. And the only thing really that you need to offset is the cylinder itself. And they're just slightly positively buoyant for the most part. Um, there's a question in here about putting real um, engines in there. Sure, yeah, it's it's been done. Um, you know, it's uh, you know a, a real diesel electric submarine. Um, this is my personal preference. This is just me. Um, you're going to have more fun with a boat that will work perfectly every single time than you will a boat that is exceptionally complicated with tons of features that ooh and ah people while it's sitting on the bench next to the pond. Um, a, a simple, reliable system, uh, electric system, is gonna be much more reliable than uh, you know a hybrid, gas, electric system. So again, possible? Absolutely. If you, if you really wanna try it, go right ahead. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Would I ever do it? No. Not unless uh, there was something, uh, for example, if you needed that boat to operate exceptionally quickly while surfaced and you needed the power of a gas powered motor to make it do so, then obviously you'd be stuck doing something like that. But uh, with the advancements in electric technology right now and battery capacity uh, and brushless motors, really the advantages of uh, gas motors over electric are dwindling exceptionally Quickly. So I certainly would not go that route uh, if I had the chance. Um, there was a question about fitting kits. So this is like a business question. Um, those were discontinued. Uh, David Merriman was the one who was manufacturing those. Uh, he came up with the, all of those products initially and I was distributing them. They are a ton of work. A lot of work. I don't think people realize how much work goes into those. There's dozens of small resin pieces and each one of them have like embedded pieces of brass and stainless steel in them that make the assembling of the model into a fully functional RC model very easy. Unfortunately, because they are so labor intensive, it was virtually impossible to manufacture them in a cost effective manner. So the cost of the fittings kits was becoming exponentially more than the cost of the model kits and people were getting grumpy. Um, 
Fortunately, Dave came to his senses uh, for the sake of his own sanity um, and discontinued them. Now, that's a big blow to the hobby, I know. And the good news is we may have found a new supplier. So Dave uh, and I are working with another gentleman by the name of Tom Schalfent, who is taking a look at reincarnating the kit. So if and or when that comes to pass, hopefully within the next few months, uh, you'll see those products back on the roster again, and you'll be able to uh, convert all of those really popular plastic model kits, uh, you know, like from Ravel and Trumpeter, uh, just make it a lot easier. Now, do you need them? Absolutely not. I, uh, if you're going to get into this hobby, you are going to need to learn skills, uh, fabrication skills, soldering skills, electrical skills. Um, and uh, if you're not to the point where you can take a piece of plastic and shape it into the shape of a dive plane, probably not the right hobby for you. Um, it'll save a lot of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll certainly you know grant that for people who want to just pay the money and skip all that hassle, you can certainly do it. But if you're doing it, if you're, if you're arguing that it's blocking you from taking part in the hobby, it's the wrong hobby for you, I'm sorry to say. Realistically, this is uh, a hobby for the elite. Uh, I'm, I'm not bragging about that. Uh, this is not like putting a, an RC car together where you just slap a motor in there, a couple of servos, and then drive around. Uh, certainly not like a boat where you throw everything in a big empty area, a little bit of weight, and you're good to go. This is nothing but engineering uh, and skill. How much do you charge for a boat? Lots. Anybody that doesn't charge a lot is not giving you a very good boat. Um, I would say realistically, if you were to find one used, you're probably going to be looking at starting around the thousand dollar mark. Uh, and that would be for a very basic boat for sure. Um, you know, they'll, they'll go up from there. Uh, you know, two and $3,000 is not unrealistic for new builds. If you're going to contract with somebody, uh, a builder to build one bespoke for you, according to your subject, your, the, the boat that you want with all the features that you want, um, realistically, you'd probably be starting at two to 3,000. Sorry about that, guys. Had a little bit of technical issues there. Um, the, the, the price that you're gonna pay, especially when you're starting to talk about things like uh, fleet boats or um, you know the, uh, the U-boats, uh, German U-boats, that is a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of detail that goes into those with, with uh, you know, the conning tower, uh, the decks and everything like that. Um, so you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, three, four, five thousand, uh, and up. Um, you know, I've, I've charged out a lot more for, uh, some boats with a lot of, of features when you're talking about torpedoes and lights and sound and that kind of thing. So again, not a cheap hobby whatsoever. Um, question about Engels kits. I saw that in there. They're new ones. Uh, I am all for, uh, what they've got going on there. Now, I have not had the chance to lay my hands on one in person, but from what I've seen, um, they look to be a great solution to get into the hobby in a in a uh, in an easier way, where you've got you know an instruction manual and absolutely everything that you need to get going. So I can't comment too much on the on the quality of performance on that because I haven't had a chance to work on one. Uh, myself, but if they're going to follow in the path of all of the other products that they put out, they're going to be doing an exceptionally good job. I would not hesitate to buy anything that Engel um, puts out. They do really, really good work. Um, quick question about the VEX radios. So they were originally created for the RC um, robot industry. Uh, VEX Robotics was the name of the company that came out with them. Six channel radios, I carry them in my store. 138 bucks includes the receiver. Uh, I love them. For what you pay and what you get, you, you basically got all the functionality of, of hobby radios at triple the price. Um, now it's kind of, it's a little bit bigger and it's like gray and yellow, so it's not very cool uh, colors or anything like that. But you've got all the computerized features of, of the more expensive radios with um, you know, channel mixing and computerized endpoints and scaling and all of that stuff. Uh, in there. So I really like them a lot. I um, use them for all of my builds. So uh, I would absolutely say, go ahead, get it, try it. They're not that expensive. Uh, if you don't like it, you haven't blown several hundred dollars on it. Um, 
there's a question, when did I get into the hobby? So I've, I've actually been doing this since 1997. Uh, that was the year I decided that RC submarines were the coolest thing ever and I was going to build my very own. Um, I had, uh, you know, just met my wife and we had no money. Um, and so decided I had to build everything from scratch. And that's uh, back to the story of my first Nautilus, just a lot of wood and putty and glue and uh, blood, sweat and tears. Three years worth of, uh, of hard work to get it going. Um, let's see here. Progress on the uh, small world model kits. So uh, as a bit of background, so um, the, the small world model came out with a, a line of, of really cool kits. I believe they're all 96 scale, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm not completely positive. I'm sure somebody can chime in there. But what happened uh, um, a year, a year and a half ago, um, I bought out the inventory for subdriver.com. And with that came the molds for um, the small world models kits. So the ones that I have uh, include the um, Blueback, which is a really cool kit. I've got that one advertised right now. And uh, on an exciting note, Dave Merriman is going to be picking up the casting of the appendages. So his superb level of skill is going to be coming into play here. Uh, first for the Blueback and then for the other ones, which uh, include a Russian Sierra, uh, the British uh, Trenchant, and the Russian Kilo. Um, all of those are really cool boats. And 96 scale is a beautiful size because they're not Tinker Toy size. They're not going to bob around uh, on the water like a cork, uh, but they are not so big that they're difficult to transport. So you can tuck them under one arm and um, bring them to the pond without much difficulty. So uh, again, Blueback is in production right now and all of the kits that are sold from this point forward will have Dave's handiwork on there. Um, and then as he gets geared up with the tooling, he'll also, we'll, we will also uh, begin to offer the um, CR Trenchant and Kilo kit. So watch for that in the very near future. Um, torpedo timing. So again, people have been watching um, the development of torpedo kits. So um, for a long time, there's been gas torpedo kits out there. Um, I played with them before. You can see the videos uh, uh, of me testing them. Um, they work. Uh, it takes a lot of tweaking to get them to work properly. You have to make sure that you've got the right orifice size and you set up uh, twisting on the vein. Sorry about that, guys. Keep uh, bumping out on you there. Um, so I went to uh, an electric version and you've seen videos of me testing that. Uh, it's slick as heck and like I, I showed you here before um, the Prototype is is basically done. I've just got to do a little bit of tweaking in terms of the buoyancy What's happening right now? It's it's operating perfectly, but the prop is sucking air at the surface So I'm gonna move the center of gravity back. We're gonna get that prop under I'm gonna put a slightly smaller prop on there That'll be done and then we're gonna be working on the launcher system um, Which is going to be basically a, a, a simple spring-loaded system if it works out, and I'm kind of excited about this, um, I'll be able to leverage Kevin McLeod's uh, TCP, Torpedo Control uh, module, which means you could, in theory, uh, control up to 10 torpedo tubes, which is pretty cool, uh, from a single channel. So basically you just keep flicking and it'll just keep uh, launching them in sequence, uh, which is very cool. So um, it's uh, an electric solenoid that will basically release a pin, it's spring loaded, shoots a torpedo out, as soon as the torpedo exits the tube, uh, magnet disengages from the reed switch and uh, your weapon swims away. Um, it's coming. Um, we are working on getting it done. Um, my big challenge and, and, and as uh, you know, background to this, you guys need to understand a little bit about, um, you know, my background and what I do. Uh, RC submarines is a hobby for me. Uh, I wish I could make a living working on RC submarines. Uh, I wish I was 20 years older so that I could retire and work on them uh, full time without needing an income. But unfortunately that is not the case uh, and I need to work uh, during the day. So my typical day uh, begins about 4 a.m. Uh, I'll get up, I'll grab a cup of coffee and I come out and I work in the garage uh, for a couple of hours um, on customer builds, getting the torpedo systems uh, set up, um, packing orders, shipping orders and that kind of thing. 
Uh, and then I go to work for eight or nine hours a day, come back, have supper, and then it's family time. Uh, I try and make sure that I balance everything out as much as I can. So that's why you don't see massive amounts of product uh, uh, development and, and um, project updates because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on it an hour or two at a time. So that's a, a little bit of uh, excuses for why you don't see a lot of velocity uh, from me. But uh, what I, I lack in velocity, I make up in, in steady progress. And uh, I think over the course of my building career, um, I'm trying to tally it up. I, I think I've built about 30 or 35 operational RC submarines for, uh, for people. And as luck would have it, or as the situation may have it, I don't own one functional boat of my own uh, yet. Um, I made a resolution last year to change that though, and I've now got a small fleet of subs that are kind of sort of almost close to being operational, uh, including my favorite boat of all time, the 66 and a half inch Disney Nautilus. Uh, that'll be my, my favorite boat, my own personal boat there. Um, there was a question about instructional DVDs. Um, the only one that I'm aware of uh, was David Merriman's Gato conversion. Uh, we're working on getting that back into production uh, as well here, and hopefully we'll be getting some uh, inventory um, out as well. Not even that's getting a little bit old now, though, and the uh, products that go into the build that we sell are a little bit different than what are highlighted in that um, instructional DVD. So uh, there's a, a, a lack of you know um, nuts to bolts, front to back, complete walkthrough. Uh, building of models. You need to understand uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of work to film every aspect of the build uh, in sequential order and then to put together an edited video. Uh, I really hope everybody really understands that, uh, you know, the, the people that are taking the time um, to do that, and there's a few of note that you'll find on um, YouTube, um, you know, props to them for taking the time to expand the hobby and, and make things as easy as possible for people uh, to build uh, boats and, and really grow the hobby. Um, on, that, on that note, you know, really what I'm worried about is uh, the fact that typically the demographic of individual who's interested in this hobby tends to be older. Um, Older professionals, you're going to see a lot of um, engineers and doctors and dentists and that kind of thing. People typically who have, uh, you know, quite a bit of education get into this uh, hobby. Um, what the problem is, is they also tend to be older. Um, if you go to, you know, some of the sub regattas and such, I think you're going to see that, you know, the average age of these people are, um, you know, certainly over 60. A lot of, of people like in their 70s. Um, but you do not see like a lot of kids, uh, and it's an expensive hobby, so they don't have a couple thousand dollars kicking around their bank accounts. Um, but you don't see a lot of 20 year olds. You don't see a lot of 30 year olds. And what gets, uh, you know, a little scary is, you know, is the, is the demographic of people who are willing to invest the time and energy to build something with their own two hands, um, dying is, is, is this, uh, going the way of the Dodo and what's going to happen to our hobby in 10 years when half of the people who are currently in it are, uh, are not around anymore. So it'll be really interesting to see, you know, how the suppliers, uh, line up. And, and I'm, I'm, when I say suppliers, I'm talking about some of the big ones, uh, out there that have the ability to create products, um, with a more ready to run, uh, feel to them where it's, um, you know, take it out of the box, uh, put the batteries in, charge it up and throw it in the water kind of thing. Um, you know, Thunder Tiger did a great thing for the hobby with their Neptune submarine. Uh, it was $600, I think, back when it first came out. And it was a heck of a boat for $600. If you ever come across one, the Thunder Tiger Neptune, uh, grab it. Grab it and, and hold on because you get a lot of boat for $600. Um, I mean, if you can grab it for $800, it would be worth it. Um, absolutely. And you can upgrade them. Uh, in a lot of ways, too, for more speed and, and better performance and that kind of thing. So keep an eye out uh, for those. Um, looking for more questions, like I said, you guys, if, if uh, you have anything that you want to know, um, just type it in the, in the chat box there and, and we can go through it. Um, 
There was uh, some questions a little while ago about uh, paint, what paint to use. Um, I use rattle cans, uh, honestly. Uh, you can see I got a whole shelf of them in the back there in multiple colors. I like Krylon um, as a brand, it works really well. One thing that I will recommend is don't mix your paints. Uh, if you're gonna do Krylon paints, then use all Krylon paints. Uh, and that includes your uh, primer and your colors and your clear coat. Um, if you mix them, um, I have found in the past you'll get things like orange peeling um, or the, the worst thing that you can end up happening, particularly if you don't let the first layer cure all the way, um, is the crazing. You know, it just it, it wrinkles up and then you've got a heck of a mess to clean up. Um, so yeah, rat rattle cans are certainly good. Now, if you talk to somebody like Dave Merriman, who is a perfectionist, um, you're going to be looking at uh, going into the realm of professional automotive paints and that kind of thing, uh, products like DuPont, um, two-part epoxy paints, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, again, you can certainly do that, and that quality of paint will certainly last, you know, a really long time. But I've had really good luck with the rattle can paints. Um, like I said, I prefer Krylon, so um, I, I would, you know, go that route there. Um, internal combustion, we talked, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, have I ever seen it? No. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you were the first one to build one. Uh, if you did, I'd certainly love to see uh, pictures and video. Send it to me. I would love to see how that ended up looking. Um, would I ever do it? No. That's, that's a heck of a lot of work. And uh, honestly, the performance of an electric motor with today's modern batteries, I don't see the purpose behind uh, going through all of that hassle. Other than to say that you did it, which is certainly valid. Um, if you want to build your own hulls, is plastic acceptable or do you need to go with fiberglass? Any water-friendly material is perfectly fine. Um, you, just like I said earlier, stay away from wood. Wood is cheap. Um, people are familiar with working to, with it. It's easy to cut. It's easy to form. It's easy to sand. Um, but not water friendly and people say well I built one and it's been perfectly fine for the last 25 years that's fine um, but you went through the hassle of, of uh, waterproofing it properly you know thinning out resin having it soaking in and all of that stuff the average person um, no I uh, the odds of a, a pinhole in your ceiling is exceptionally high and it's gonna crack and, and break so um, yeah plastic Sheeting uh, is is perfectly acceptable. Um, I've got all manner of that kind of stuff in here. I've got some Sintra board. Uh, I've got acrylic. I've got Lexan. Um, you know anything that you've got that is going to be water friendly. Um, yeah, go ahead and build it. The one thing I will say though, you need to watch is make sure you use the right adhesives. Um, you're going to want at least a 24 hour like a two part epoxy. Um, the faster curing epoxies, while they would be fine probably for years, um, over time absorb the water, they turn mushy and, and soft. So you don't want to go through all that work uh, and have your joint give way. Um, use the long curing uh, epoxies to get everything um, you know, cured together. And then you, uh, uh, it's a certainly a good idea, especially on the internal parts of your boat where a lot of your adhesion uh, is exposed paint it. Um, I actually like to do, um, uh, it's a spray on um, bed liner, I guess, for, for lack of a, a better term, on the inside. I'm just going to say, I can't get to it. It's all blocked off on the other side there, but um, looks good. And uh, it's a nice thick layer on the inside and it waterproofs everything really, really nice. Um, 30 second parallel Gato conning tower. Can you 3D print? Um, hmm. Something like that, I guess, right? Uh, now that's about, I think this is 50th scale, if I remember correctly. Um, but if, you know, for 3D printing, what you really, um, I, I recommend you check out is Shapeways, shapeways.com. Um, for detailed pieces, 3D printing is, you can't beat it. Uh, you know, for things like deck guns and, and um, you know, all of the details in the World War II, 
uh, fleet boat conning towers and U-boat conning towers. They've got all different scales in there, and really the prices are exceptionally reasonable. Like I think a uh, like a 48 scale deck gun with with like every rivet and nut and bolt and and uh, trigger and everything is is like 40 or 50 bucks. It's ridiculous. Um, so check out Shapeways. Uh, if you see a conning tower and it's in the wrong scale, reach out to the artist that did it because the beautiful thing about digital files is they can just scale it um, to basically whatever size you want. Um, so I would definitely recommend that as an option. Um, favorite World War II submarine? I, I have to say the Type 7. There's just something right about that. And I would, I would say I, I want the, the late war uh, dual winter garden version, the extended winter garden version. Stretches the boat out a little bit, makes it look really slick. Um, I did a static model. It was one of the first commission builds that I did uh, of an OTW kit. So that's the, the big 82 inch long version and it's just a gorgeous boat. Um, you know, the, the, the American fleet boats, they look okay, but like I said, there's something about the proportions of those German boats that uh, I really, really like. Um, X-Tails, you know, I haven't had a lot of experience with X-Tails. I've done a couple of them. They're not overly complicated, really. Um, you know, you're, you're still talking about a cruciform um, set of control surfaces, but it's just tilted on the side. So you're still using two servos, uh, one for the horizontal um, plane and one for the uh, vertical plane. Um, the only thing is you just need to get a mixer. You get an X-Tail mixer. Um, I think I've got um, what I call a V-tail mixer uh, on, in my online store and that basically mixes the inputs from your rudder and uh, pitch control uh, so that you get your um, control. So really it's, it's not hard to implement uh, at all. Um, all right, can you explain how to make an easy static diving ballast tank? Um, I have in the resource section of my site a detailed explanation of like six or eight different ballast uh, systems um, and some of them are easier to um, use than others. Now what I'll do just because it's here right now and it is probably the simplest ballast system out there, um, I'll just show you this, this gas style ballast system. So this is um, you know your ballast tank and it's open at the bottom there's three holes in there so what basically happens is when you dive uh, this servo on the inside pushes that arm out this arm swivels and it opens up the vent the air bubbles out of the ballast vent water comes in through the holes in the bottom and it fills up the ballast tank the model gets heavier sinks underneath the water now to surface what you've got right here is uh, a pressure vessel and you use um, airbrush propellant and uh, it's a basically liquid air. It's the same kind of stuff that they use for computer duster keyboards. Um, you fill up your pressure vessel in there and then you can see if the uh, servo pulls, uh, so the opposite direction there, um, it depresses that little tire valve, that Schrader valve, and that allows air to blow into the ballast tank, it displaces the water which is forced out of the holes and the model rises. So it's a very, very simple system. Um, I would recommend that for a, you know, a first time builder if you're going to be building something from, uh, from scratch. That would probably be the, the best way to go. Um, Professional building, answer if I'm using a computer, computer controller, no. Uh, I, I have not had the time to uh, you know, get into the really cool control systems. That's something that I actually wanted to do. I have bought myself uh, an Arduino um, you know, starter kit. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, basically Arduino is, is a, you know, a command and control language and it's got all standardized parts and it's open source and it's like everywhere. Uh, in the world, there's people doing absolutely amazing things with them. You can build all sorts of modules and integrate them, like GPS systems and you know voltage monitors and compasses and all that kind of thing. So basically, if you um, teach yourself the uh, ability to code and, and to build simple hardware, um, the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do. And what I would really love to see is 
uh, you know, a group of people to get together and, and build some open source stuff for submarines. You know, there's a lot of people doing it for themselves, um, but if we can share that information out, you know, through the forums, um, we could really uh, create some really, really cool stuff that uh, everybody could take advantage of. And not everybody's going to be able to, you know, build stuff like that. They don't have the ability, knowledge, or um, desire to, to learn it. So, um, you know, for those other people, if you can, can pair up with a manufacturer, we can start sending modules out uh, to people that are kind of more plug and play. So short answer is I haven't done it a lot myself. Um, I'm still of the uh, old school... Um, you know, analog kind of stuff. Um, and um, that's why I got just, like I said, simple. You turn it on, it powers up, you throw it in the water, you drive it around, and it comes home every single time. Um, thanks for the compliments there. The F type is outside the garage door. If you guys have been following me for a long time, I'm a car guy. I always have. I, I started out um, with a, a replica Lamborghini Countach. Um, I built it on a Fiero frame. Um, I think I've still got videos up, maybe on my YouTube channel, or if not, I think I've got pictures um, on my old RC-submarine or sorry, RC-sub.com site. I've got pictures of my car. So I have had I had that car. Then I bought an old wrecked Dodge Viper and I fixed that up. I drove that for a while and I had a, a Lotus. Uh, a lease that I supercharged, and that was all sorts of fun. So it just kind of built up over time. My favorite of all time, though, was a Noble uh, M12. I don't know if you guys are British sports car fanatics, but Jeremy Clarkson loved that one. Uh, one of his favorite cars of all time, uh, Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear, a uh, little Noble M12. Uh, it's a twin turbo uh, six cylinder car. It was super fast and really, really fun. I love unique, uh, unique cars. Um, hey, lots of people saying you're following my channel. I'm, that, that's awesome. It's it's good to hear. Um, you know, it, it is a lot of work to put this stuff up, but I love hearing from people all over the world. And really, um, you know, how I got started with that was with my rc-sub.com website. My wife got it for me when I first started building so that I could blog or document my uh, first build. And, um, you know, since then I've had the opportunity to talk with people all over the world, to build subs for people all over the world. Uh, and um, I've had the opportunity to uh, work with some really cool um, people and, and entities. I've uh, corresponded back and forth with the US Navy. Uh, I have uh, built a functional model of a, a submarine that NASA is uh, thinking about sending up to Titan. Um, if you take a look at my channel, you got the, uh, the, the turtle, the Titan turtle. Um, that was a really, really neat project. We were talking about doing a bigger scale version of that. So I got to go to um, uh, NASA there and actually operate it um, while Discovery Channel Canada was there. So that was, uh, that was very cool. Um, Looks like we're coming up on about 45 minutes, got about 15 minutes left, uh, unless you guys are uh, tapering off in terms of questions, certainly um, keep them coming if you've uh, got any questions. Um, brushless motors, hey, I could talk about brushless motors. Uh, lots of people are like, why don't you just throw brushless motors uh, in everything? Well, typically, brushless motors are you know high torque, but they're super high RPM, like you know, 10, 20, 30,000 RPM. Um, what the, the problem with that is, is you're running a shaft uh, through a, a seal and the seal uh, needs to take all of those revolutions and it's going to wear out um, quite quickly when you're operating in that. So the solution is to build a gearbox and now you're adding another layer of complexity. Um, what you'll find with most of the cylinders that are out there, you're going to go with a direct drive motor. Um, so it's from the motor, uh, it's straight out through the um, seal, um, no complication, everything moves very, very smoothly and of course it's much more efficient when you're not uh, having to go through uh, a drive system uh, like a gearbox or belt drive and, and that kind of thing. Um, could talk about seals too, you know, this is really interesting. So OTW um, has a, a nitrile seal and um, it's basically an O-ring 
we can do some doodles on my doodle board here. That's what I got ready for you guys. <clears throat> so there's, there's really kind of two main seals that are out there. There are, well, three. Let's, let's talk about the simplest one out there. Um, that is, um, this is be a side profile. You've got your shaft kind of running through there. And then on the inside, you've got a, an O-ring that seals against the shaft. That's just a rubber O-ring. Those are typically high uh, friction. You're gonna get a lot of friction in there. The other ones that uh, you've got um, are cup seals. So this is, these are again all side profiles and the, the cup seal basically looks like a C. And as water pressure um, comes in, it, it forces this apart and it seals harder against the shaft. So the deeper you go, the, the harder it seals. Now the, um, the OTW version is actually one that I like a lot. So you've got your main shaft here. Um, you've got your O-ring sealing against it. And you've got the body of your um, seal. And then on this side, this is all threaded. And you've basically got like a bolt on the outside here. So what you can do is you can twist that down and, and uh, it will squish that O-ring against the shaft. And so you've basically got um, a variable compression seal. And uh, the, the way that you're gonna set that up is um, pressurize your cylinder and tighten the nut down until the bubbles stop coming out, until they just stop coming out. Uh, and that allows you to set just the right amount of friction um, on your drive shaft. Now these are for your, your drive shafts. The other thing that you've got obviously are linkages. Um, and so these are for your control surfaces, your rudders and your dive planes uh, and that kind of thing. So you can utilize those seals. And here's some examples, actually I can show you actual physical examples. Uh, so these are like O-ring style versions with just like O-rings inside. Uh, and then you've got the cup style uh, and you, you're really not gonna be able to see this in here at all, but that's a, a cup seal in the inside of those. And then the last one is uh, a bellows seal. Uh, and these are basically designed to seal up against your end cap. Uh, and then the other end seals against your linkage rod. And as it moves, uh, it compresses and extends that seal. So it is um, basically a, a hard, solid seal, um, stationary on both parts, and your, your bellows compresses to um, um, allow you to, to have that uh, degree of movement. Um, all right, I wasn't pointing this thing, and I know there's a bunch of comments that came through. Will 72 and 75 megahertz ever become extinct? Yes. We are, uh, the writing is really on the walls until somebody steps up and um, starts manufacturing them specifically for submarines because really, um, unless you're going through the water, there's no advantage to 72, 75 megahertz uh, or 40 megahertz uh, in Europe uh, versus the gigahertz frequencies. Um, gigahertz obviously propagates through air much stronger, much further than the um, lower frequency radio. So 75 megahertz, uh, there's just no demand. So there's quite a few out there. Um, you know, what would be great is if, if uh, you know, a manufacturer would step up and do limited run, you know, even if the radios were twice as expensive, it's just vitally important that we still have access uh, to them. So we'll have to, if you come across them, grab them because uh, they're gonna be harder and harder to find. Um, question about 30 second parallel. Actually, one of my first subs was an old 30 second parallel Typhoon kit. Uh, 30 second parallel, they specialize in 30 second scale models. Um, they had like a big, uh, I think Ohio class. I think they might have done a Type 7. This, this was before my time. I think they were in like early 90s. Um, but their kits were not particularly um, accurate. Uh, but they're a great cheap way to get into the hobby. Um, Aiken scale models, I don't know them, couldn't tell you anything about them. Um, beginner's first submarine. So uh, if you take a look at my um, build blogs for the Disney Nautilus, 
uh, I've done a walkthrough, I think it was like seven parts from beginning to end, you know, talking about instructional videos again. Um, for a beginner, I highly recommend ballasting slightly positive. Um, so you're gonna use your dive planes to pull the model underneath the water. And the reason for that is that if anything goes wrong, uh, if you lose power, uh, if you lose signal, um, the model can stop and it'll eventually float back up to the surface again. So worst case scenario is you just stop, take your hands off the controls, eventually it'll find its way back up to the surface. Um, really, I do not recommend ballasting for complete static diving unless you are very confident and familiar with RC submarines. Um, to understand the point when you pass neutral buoyancy and get into negative buoyancy, um, particularly if you're moving, the boat can give you a false sense of, um, of uh, static um, or neutral buoyancy. So even if it is slightly um, negative, the boat can still fight itself up until it stops and then it sinks and you can't see that and down it goes. So not uh, um, recommended for people who are not very, very familiar with the um, operation of um, RC submarines. Um, there's a, qu a quick question about depth cruiser. Um, the depth cruiser module, no, does not uh, mount in the wet. It mounts inside the uh, cylinder and the only thing that it needs access to is a port uh, where the water goes in through a tube and that's how it monitors the pressure. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the depth cruiser is a really cool uh, deal. So when we're talking about depth control, there's two modules that you're going to be thinking about. One is the uh, pitch controller, which you are going to be controlling your um, dive planes with, typically your rear dive planes. You can set those up to be um, autonomous, so they just need power and it'll operate all on its own. Or you can override them with your pitch controller. Your front dive planes can be uh, hooked up to the depth cruiser, and the way that that works is you um, basically push down to whatever operational depth you want to operate at, take your hand off, depth cruiser takes over, monitors the pressure of the water and it, it changes the uh, pitch of the bow planes to keep the boat at that depth. So the really cool thing is not only will you be um, cruising around uh, you know, perfectly level, but you'll be maintaining the same depth the whole time. So it's a really cool module. Uh, I played around with it just a little bit, but uh, I recommend it to uh, anybody who really wants to add um, you know, a degree of safety um, and just a smooth operation to your um, boats. Um, future live chat. So, so Tom, hey, good to see you. We need to talk about those fitting kits, buddy. Um, instructional or freeform. So this is all freeform. I wanted to knock out, you know, kind of um, um, questions, uh, the, the, the overarching questions, the common questions. Uh, instructional is really cool though and I could see doing things like uh, you know conversion of uh, servos to linear operation um, you know setting up the electronics uh, in a watertight cylinder of course the trick is you need to be able to fit it inside about a one hour window um, but if you guys have any thoughts um, pop some comments in send me an email uh, let me know what you would want to see in terms of an instructional video and we can either do that live or I can create uh, an instructional video uh, that'll live out on its own that you guys can um, take a look at. Um, what do we got here? All right. Well, you know what, guys? We're, we're starting to run down. Well, I can answer just a couple of more questions. I just want you to um, keep that in mind. Um, I think I've caught everything. Hopefully I didn't miss anything. All right. Hey, there was a, there was a, a, a message. Um, Dave, you working on his wet Nelly. So, um, oh, weathering paint. But the wet Nelly, that's the James Bond boat. So um, just so you guys know, and I think I've, I've, you've, seen glimpses of it. I'm working on a, a one-tenth scale um, James Bond um, 
Lotus submarine. Uh, hope to have that done in the next few months. It's very, very close. Um, that's going to be a really, really cool project, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, weathering. Um, oil paints are really, really good for that, and Dave Merriman is just an expert on that. I don't use them very often, but what I do love to use uh, are weathering pastels. Um, you know, I've got lots of different colors here, you know, yellows and greens and browns. Um, I'll actually use the pastel chalks uh, as well. Uh, you can see the weathering kits, you know, like that in there. Um, salt, if you guys followed my uh, weathering of my Type 7, uh, salt chipping is something that I've done with pretty good effect. Really only works on large scale models because the salt flakes are typically pretty big. Um, you can also use toothpaste, but what I found with toothpaste is it gets under the edges and it kind of bleeds white, which kind of looks cool uh, in and of itself. I'm not going to get into the process of that. We could do an instructional video on that. I have done an instructional video on that um, with that Type 7, the painting and weathering chapter. Um, and the other thing that uh, I use particularly on my Nautilus models uh, is this oxidizing iron paint by um, Modern Masters. Uh, and basically, it's uh, iron powder held in solution. And uh, you, I mix it up with a little bit of vinegar. You apply it, and it makes real rust. It looks really cool. If you uh, have a chance, take a look at my painting video for the Disney Nautilus, and that uh, will show you a lot of, uh, of rusting technique. So uh, for me, you know, like I said, um, pastels I, I go uh, with a lot. And then um, I find I actually don't need to seal them. They stay on really well, particularly if you've got a matte finish on your clear coat. Um, you don't need to seal them up afterwards. Um, you know what, I think, unless anybody else has a last minute question, I'm going to cut it off here, we're at like 57 minutes. I had a lot of fun, uh, it was great seeing or hearing uh, from anyone. Uh, love comments, if there's something that you want to uh, touch on, uh, hit me up and we'll uh, catch it next month. Um, Check out my site. I'll have uh, on the homepage there with the date of the next uh, live chat. We can do, like I said, either an instructional thing if I get enough interest, or we'll just chat. We can do that too. Uh, thanks for joining me, everyone. We will catch you next time. Have a great night. See you later.